especially as we see renewed lockdowns in some of the hardest hit states, do you think the S&P um, has to come down some? Yeah, so we, this has, you know, if we look at the pattern of the, the recovery in markets, the, the, the decline and then the following recovery in markets um, compared to past instances, um, yes, this has been the sharpest recovery, but it, but it also came up after the sharpest decline in Q1. So, um, so in a way, it was just a really, really sharp V. Now, looking forward, yes, there are grounds to think that the moves in the markets will be a bit more choppy, a bit more range-bound. We, we think we are in a recovery phase. The recovery won't be uh, you know, smooth, as I pointed to earlier. There are a few things to think about in terms of the economic recovery, particularly in the U.S., and valuations have climbed, especially if you look at 12 months forward. However, um, if you, you know, the S&P is not just a reflection of the U.S. economy, it is you know, sort of very much, uh, you have sort of concentrated makeup of the S&P. It's very tech heavy. Those profit pools have been growing. The NASDAQ has done even better for that reason because it is even more tech heavy. So the S&P and the NASDAQ, they just simply have um, large concentrations of companies that are you know, poised to benefit further in this environment. But yes, the road ahead won't look like Q2. It will be a little bit choppier. And it's no surprise that implied volatilities have stayed actually a little bit more resilient, even as the markets have climbed higher in Q2. You also had, of course, the support from central banks. Not that we expect that to, um, uh, to be reduced, Supriya, but um, we don't necessarily expect it to be increased either. Has that all been priced in? from central banks. So whether you look at the amount coming from central banks or indeed from fiscal authorities, it's, you know, if, if, if you look ahead at, at um, where it's likely to be at the end of the year, it's going to be about twice the level uh, relative to GDP that we saw in the, in the GFC, for instance. So there's no doubt this is helping markets. Um, and, you know, the, the low level of yields is also underpinned market valuations. But that's justified. You know, investors have to allocate to risk assets. And if you have low yields, um, you know, bond deals, you're bound to see those valuations climbing higher and, uh, and, and, and those um, sort of yields, uh, you know, in, in risk assets coming down, the risk premium coming down in, in other risk assets as investors go out and search um, in the search for yield, uh, both in credit as well as in equities. So, uh, so some of that is justified and we don't see any pause in, um, in you know, we, we don't think that central banks are going to pare back their purchases anytime soon, leave alone raise rates. We got indications um, in the FOMC minutes um, this week that that was unlikely to be the case. Um, we're likely to see further forward guidance, rates lower for longer. So none of that is likely to change, and that will underpin valuations. Valuations are justified in being higher than they would be otherwise based on this liquidity. But what we've seen in this crisis is significant um, fiscal support, uh, not just in the US, but also in the UK and Europe and elsewhere. So that means that, you know, that that's going to provide more support to the real economy and that will come through as we move from, you know, recovery-based fiscal support to stimulus-based fiscal support, so infrastructure and so forth. 